Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judici Judiciary Committee. It is Wednesday, May 5th, and we are going to be looking at H428, uh, which is a bill um, regarding um, hate-motivated crimes uh, that we passed and um, the Senate passed and did make some changes. So, um, so we do have attorney Bryn Hare here to um, help us understand the, uh, the other bodies uh, changes. Thank you, Bryn. Sure. Good afternoon, committee. For the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. Um, I think that you all have draft 3.1 of uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee Amendment to H428. Um, and so I'm going to be reviewing that. They did do a strike all amendment. Um, this is a pretty short and straightforward bill. So I think that it's it's not going to be um, too difficult to point out where the two differ. Um, but if the committee remembers the way you passed the bill was to make some pretty limited amendments to the hate crime statute, specifically you removed the word maliciously so that in order to seek this enhanced penalty, a prosecutor wouldn't have to prove that the conduct was maliciously motivated by the, uh, the victim's protected status but just that the conduct was motivated by the victim's protected status. And you also added the words or the National Guard to the list of protected categories. And then the third thing that you did, and you did, you made that change, um, the removal of the word maliciously, you did that both in the hate motivated crime statute and the cross burning prohibition statute. And then the last thing you did was to um, include some language that required an annual report um, to the General Assembly, specifically the Committees on Judiciary, um, that required the um, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs and the Office of the Attorney General to report um, data to the committees on um, categories of bias motivation and types of offenses that were coded with an offender bias motivation um, and that was to be an annual report to the committees and some other, it was required some other reporting as well. So that's what you did. And the Senate, um, first of all, removed that annual report requirement. So that no longer appears in the hate crimes um, statute. Uh, they left the, your removal of the word maliciously. So that's still not there. And they added the words in whole or in part. If you're looking at the Senate amendment, you'll see that on line 10. So the language now provides that a person who um, commits any crime whose conduct is motivated in whole or in part by the victim's protected status is subject to um, criminal penalties. Um, the second change that they made was to, you'll see that the list of protected categories is struck out there on lines 11 through 13 and replaced with the term protected category. Um, and they've defined the word protected category in subsection C. So they've just sort of taken that list out and plopped it into a definition instead. Um, they, the change of adding the National Guard, they left there. And then um, lastly, they've added this subsection B, which is a provision that the victims actual or perceived protected category um, doesn't need to be the predominant or the sole reason for the defendant's conduct. Um, so that sort of plays, ties together with the language in whole or in part that they inserted in subsection A. And then um, section two remains the same as the house pass version, just removing the word maliciously in the cross burning statute. And then they added section three, and this is um, subdivision six from the civil statute on hate crimes. And this was really just my suggestion for a technical correction to drop in or the National Guard in that statute as well, um, where it defines protected category. So um, that is the extent of the changes. And I see that there are questions. Yeah, thank you, Bryn. Um, did they did um, they take any testimony on the um, um, the data section? I do not believe that they did take testimony on that section um, that I can recall. I wasn't always there, so um, I can't say that with certainty. But I don't believe so. Okay. Or or and any discussion that you remember about 
about that section and 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 um, why to so take it out that I think that there was a concern about the burden um, on the the entities that were tasked with with collecting and reporting that data. And I believe there was also some conversation about the number of reports that um, are received by the General Assembly and whether or not they are reviewed. Thank you. Um, let's see, I know I saw Ken's hand up. Ken, Tom, Martin. Thank you. Uh, Brent, will you just explain to me on that line 10 what in whole or in part, what 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 does that mean? Why was that inserted? So that it um, essentially broadens the the statute a little bit to per, so that um, if a prosecutor is seeking this enhanced penalty, so if a person commits a crime and that crime is motivated by the victim's protected status, um, essentially what it's saying is that the person could have more than one reason for committing this crime against this particular victim. Um, the victim's protected status need not be the only um, reason for the defendant's criminal conduct towards the victim. Thank you. Yeah, that- oh. Tom and then Martin. All right, thank you. Uh, that was gonna be one of my questions too about that in whole or in part. So, so, so Bryn, does that make it easier to charge somebody? Uh, harder to charge somebody i mean if it's broader i guess it's going to be easier to charge somebody and I, i'm just wondering if there could be some ramifications with it with people maybe getting potentially getting charged with something they didn't do i guess would that be more possible well um i think you could see it as as um, potentially being easier for prosecutors to um, obtain a conviction, although it may also be seen as clarification because the existing language doesn't specify if it has to be the only reason. Um, so it, it may, you could look at it both ways, I suppose. Sure, sure, yeah, great, thank you. And um, I just find it interesting and maybe you can explain why in uh, section 1A, uh, race, color, religion, all that's uh, crossed out, but then in uh, uh, the following uh, sections, it, it's put back in. I think I think two yeah. more times. So that that was really um, this was. I see this is really a technical change to the to the section of law because that's how it's written in the civil counterpart. Um, it's the the list is defined as protected category. Um, and so that way you don't have this long list that's hanging out in this pro in this language about what is prohibited. And instead you've got a definition that you can reference. And oh, okay. So I, I see that as really being more of a technical change there. All right, great. And, and one more, uh, if you can do it real quick, uh, what did the study do? The study that was in the house version? Yes, yeah, the study that they pulled. So that was it. wasn't a study so much as it was a it was a requirement for data reporting, and it required that the um, I'm just going to pull it up really quickly. It yep. required that the how that the um, executive director for states attorneys and sheriffs and the office of um, the attorney general submit an annual report that detailed for the prior year um, all incidents that were reported to the national incident based reporting system on um, for crimes that were bias motivated. Um, any convictions in the criminal division uh, that were enhanced pursuant to the hate crime statute. Um, any reported bias incidents that resulted in a final judgment in the, in the civil division. Um, and then to the extent feasible, you it required that um, demographic information about the defendants be included um, and the reporting could protect the confidentiality of the victims. Right, and you said you weren't there, so you, you weren't sure why? So they there was some conversation about it. I, I wasn't there for every hearing, so there may have been testimony taken that I missed, um, but they they there was some sort of general conversation about the number of, of reports that are received by the General Assembly and, um, and, and questions about whether those reports were always were always uh, read by by members. Right, right. And, and would there be, 
I mean, we've we've done a lot of stuff here in the last you know couple of years around um, you know uh, mainly around race, but and now we're getting more into the gender stuff. But um, is there other uh, 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 reporting or or studies or anything like that that could uh, that that may make up for some of that information? So I know that. I don't feel like I'm equipped to answer that at the moment because I'm not sure where the, the status of all of the bills that are moving that I am not drafting. Um, sure. So I know that there are some days, some bills that may not be making it all the way through this year that require a bunch of data collection. Um, but I'm not up to speed on all of them. I'm sorry. No, no, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's only one. What? what? Seven, eight hundred. I don't know. <laughs> All right, thank you. And I do want to point out that that this language was worked on, I believe, by James Pepper, the Attorney General's office. Um, I think the victims' advocates were involved. But um, so, in terms of workload and, and ability to do this, I'm not. I'm not sure that's an issue because because this was a proposal that was that was brought uh, forth. Uh, to us from from stakeholders um yeah what, one more thing maxine since you brought that up it just crossing my mind and something that Bryn said too or just our conversation is how, how do we potentially uh not duplicate i guess you know with with all the all the studies that we do um especially around the, the uh you know the racial issues that were uh you know we've done a lot of work on um, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, traffic stuff or crimes or, you know, hate crimes. Uh, um, I just hate to see it, it doubled up, I guess, you know, if, if there's anything else and, uh, you know, going through the legislature. Yeah, no, I understand. That's why we need a Bureau of Racial Statistics yeah. at some point. <laughs> okay. But that's another conversation. But yeah, yeah no, I, no, I agree. Makes... Instead of having it piecemeal throughout, we need an entity that will do that important work. Um, let's see. Can uh, Selena and Martin? Uh, I think Martin was up before I was. Whatever. <laughs> Happy to concede you can. Go ahead. So uh, just. So, uh, Bren, just to go back to that, um, I, don't, I don't want to make too big of a deal of this, but that that in whole or in part, couldn't, the one thing that really scares me about uh, things is, wouldn't two lawyers interpret those things differently? That meaning differently, I should say? Well, I think lawyers can always interpret things differently. I don't, uh, you know, I think that's kind of the nature of lawyers. But I think if your question is um, if, if that is clear language, um, that is language that other states use in their hate crime statutes. And I think that it is clarified by, the, by subdivision B, um, which provides that the victim's protected status doesn't need to be the predominant reason or the only reason for a defendant's conduct. So um, I hope that helps you in your determination of whether or not it's clear enough. Yeah, your first part of that answer was probably one of the best ever, thanks. Okay, go ahead, Martin. <laughs> well, as a lawyer, uh, I resemble that, I suppose. Um, so actually, I, Ken was getting to the issue and you answered one of my questions is whether other states did this and, and, and or had the same kind of language. Uh, the other question I had, and I think you probably answered this one as well, but I want to make sure that, that when, when we have different language in B, is that clarifying what we mean in, all, in whole or in part where we're using slightly different language uh, the predominant or the sole reason? I mean, is this just like piling on or, or giving more clarity or is it going to confuse things because we're using two different phrases? Um, you know, uh, we did, the committee did talk a little bit about whether 
whether they should limit it to just that in whole or in part. And an earlier draft of the bill um, was a little bit broader and it provided that um, the defendant's conduct need not be, um, I think a significant reason was the word that was used, a significant reason, the predominant reason or the, and they removed that. I can't remember if it was significant. I may have to check on that. Um, but they, they tried to narrow it in scope um, a little bit so that it was, uh, it was instead, it doesn't have to be um, a predominant or sole reason for the defendant's conduct. So I think that the Senate ultimately came to the conclusion that it provided um, additional clarity as opposed to muddling things, which, okay. is, why they, which is why and, they did it that way. And is it unfair for me to ask you if you agree with that? Um, I, you know, to me, I see it as really a policy question, whether you want to become that specific about um, about how much of a motivation factor it needs to be, or if you want to leave it in the hands of the court to decide. Um, so I think that if you left it as in whole or in part, it would be a little bit less specific than it is now with the with the additional language in subdivision B. All right. So one, one other question, and I think this is to to perhaps help us in how how this will be interpreted. Uh, could you tell us kind of the, the standard that a court uses when there, if there's any kind of ambiguity in a criminal statute, how it, it's my understanding that the court reads it in favor of a defendant. It, it, I may have that slightly wrong if, if you're able to kind of elucidate that a little bit. So they'll look to the plain meaning of the words. I mean, there, I think they, there are several things that courts will look to in interpreting a statute. They'll look to the plain meaning of the words. They'll um, try and interpret it in a way that makes sense as opposed to, you know, they want to avoid any result that um, would either be nonsensical or unfair. Um, and, and, but with respect to criminal statutes in particular, is that your question? Yeah. Yeah, I thought that there was a, a standard of uh, interpretation that kind of gives the benefit of the doubt to a defendant. I think that is, I, that does sound right to me. Um, in order to give you the precise standard, I'd like to um, take a minute to look it up. First. Yeah, it, that would, it would be nice to have that just generally because when we look at these kind of cases to understand, you know, if there is any ambiguity, where, where, where does it fall? You know, so I, pre I would appreciate that. Thanks. Sure. And it doesn't have to be now, just email it to us at some point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, then I'll move to uh, Selena. Oh, I think this is a little redundant. It's just, I was actually raised my hand to comment on what you said about the reporting section way back, which is that um, that section had, um, there had been work with, I think, um, crime research group and others, and I drew on work from other bills to just really make sure that we were talking about an achievable, you know, existing data set that could be readily um, communicated into a report. So I don't know if this bill is the right, ultimately the right place for that provision, but it is something that I think um, was very important to the sponsors of H128 and um, that we'd love to try to find a home for seeing if we can continue to carry that forward. Right. So it passed the Senate today. Um, might get messaged today and be on notice or a, yeah, so it'd be a notice tomorrow. I'm just trying to think about how much time we have to, to think it through. Yep, it should be on notice in the house tomorrow. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions or, or thoughts? So I do have the answer to Representative Malone's question. But I can wait until everybody else finishes asking their question. Um, go ahead. Thanks. Okay, so I can send that. There's some some Supreme Court cases um, that talk about this, and I can send them to the committee. 
but there's a rule of lenity that requires the court to resolve any statutory ambiguity in favor of the criminal defendant. Um, and it's been ingrained in the criminal law for decades, I believe in, since the early 1800s. So if there is, um, if there is a doubt that um, in the construction of the statute, then it will resolve it in favor of the defendant. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So, uh, so Ken can sound like an attorney in the future. He just has to remember the rule of lenity, and then. Th thank you, Bryn. Okay, uh, Barbara. So, in trying to decide our options, is there? Are you worried that if there were a conference committee, there wouldn't be time to address it? If like should how seriously should that be an option? So much, no, I'm not so much worried about time. I'm just kind of thinking it through as to whether or not okay. there um, is another bill to, to put it on. Yeah, you know, certainly we have the miscellaneous judiciary bill. Right, okay. Um, right. But this, but it was important to the, uh, to the bill's sponsors of, of 128, it was important to us. Right. Um, and there was, there was work done on, um, on behalf of the group that got together to, right. you know, and came back with very specific recommendations about what could be obtainable, what, you know. Right. So, um, and we know data is important, but, um, it is curious why it got taken out. Yeah. So, given that we don't have to act today, I think it's I think it's a good idea for us to to wait and think about it. Thanks. And then um, tomorrow, if uh, Martin, you have a big lineup of uh, of witnesses, but um, may need to carve out some time tomorrow morning to to respond to this if it's on if it's on notice um, tomorrow, so that we'll be prepared for Thursday. I mean, tomorrow is Thursday, <clears throat> so we'll be prepared for Friday, yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Okay. All right. So any other questions for Bryn before we adjourn? No? Okay. All right. Well, so before we do, uh, uh, Madam Speaker, Madam Chair, sorry, it's been yeah. a long day. So, uh, so I'm wondering if we should uh, talk in the committee about H317 and where we're going to try to head for that, or should we talk offline later? I'm just wondering um, if you might want to know. Or either way, did you, did you want to report on um, the RDAP meeting, or is that what yeah, you're yeah, and and, and uh, if Coach wants to. Uh, perhaps just, just to let folks know where we are and what uh, Coach and I think the next step uh, is going to be. Coach, are you good with that or, or do you want to do that some other time? Uh, if we could probably do it pretty succinctly. All right, yeah, go ahead. Or do you want me to? I'm, I was gonna, I'm deferring <laughs> to you, Coach, I'm deferring to you. Well, uh, I think everybody's aware uh, of uh, the proposal that we put forth to RDAP. And that was to have RDAP be uh, the home of the Bureau of Racial Statistics. So they called a uh, special meeting uh, that occurred on Tuesday. And upon um, their review of the proposal, there was a lot of interest. But as there always is with these, you know, standing up a new program, uh, there's always a lot of questions as well. So basically where we're at and what we would like to propose is, is that we shift this to a working group that would formalize the details of the move so that when we come back at the beginning of the next session, we'll be able to move 
the the program forward. Um, and this way, everyone, all of the players, the partners, uh, because when you look at the composition of our DAP, uh, it's it it encompasses the areas that we would want it to, uh, and having it sit there. Uh, there's just a few minor corrections that uh, the bill would take moving forward. For example, um, the language to include the Office of Racial Equity into RDAP itself. It wasn't there because it wasn't in existence when RDAP passed. The office has been participating but it's been kind of participating uh, ex officio. So what we would be doing in this new draft would be setting forth the uh, expectations of the working group. We would correct the uh, statutory language for the Office uh, of Racial Equity and also uh, correct the size of RDAP to include two additional members that would be appointed by the Office of Racial Equity to also add more um, um, uh, community voice uh, of the affected communities to uh, the committee, which they felt very uh, comfortable with uh, those amendments. So that that's the Cliff Notes version. Uh, does that? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think the bottom line is to try to uh, having a having a working group to uh, to kind of iron out those details, uh, so that by the end of the year we'll have uh, those details worked out into either three seventeen or a different bill. Uh, and I think the concept is that the working group is, and what I would propose is that it would go into the miscellaneous. Uh, judiciary bill. <clears throat> and I also talked to, I, I was talking to Eric about uh, S3 and just asked him what kind of timing he had. So perhaps coach and I, and if there's somebody else who wants to be part of it, we'll be talking with Eric, hopefully by the end of this week, Friday or Monday, depending on your schedule, uh, coach, uh, to get some language together that we can look at next week. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. And I did last week um, speak to Sarah Friedman from the Council for State Governments, um, who has been attending our DAP meetings and, and uh, looking closely at this issue um, in her role as um, consulting on uh, justice reinvestment too. So, and she also had some some thoughts and models of some other states that we could look to, but. Um, yeah, and she's she was there last. Yeah. Night. I think that's yeah. it. And, and yeah. she was very uh, eager to be part of this as well. It's kind of right. folded into justice reinvestment too. Right. right. So I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Right. right. Thanks for mentioning that because she was a. Um, she shared, you know, her thoughts on behalf of uh, CSG, and that um, I think helped some of the other members see that. Uh, this could move forward in a positive way. Okay, great. So you'll be meeting with with Eric to get some some language, correct? Yep. Okay, great. And um, Sarah and I we're going to talk after last night's meeting, so I'll ch you know check in with her as well. But great. but yeah, no, that sounds good. Thank you. Okay, well, let's adjourn because I have a meeting and I'm sure other people <laughs> have more meetings as well and phone calls to make before the meeting. <laughs>